Yeah, I grew up in suburban New Jersey outside of Philadelphia. My father was an electrical engineer at RCA and he married my mother. She was his secretary and we lived in Morristown. Every summer we would go traveling to national parks. We were fishing and hiking um, up in Pennsylvania. Mar and I met around the age of four. We both loved riding bikes, playing marbles, scrapbooking, collecting lightning bugs and worms. We searched for four-leaf clovers in our lawns. She always found them before and more often than I did. She seemed to have a mysterious sixth sense when it came to things like that, and it turns out she did. Her powers of observation always were and still are otherworldly. What I learned from Mar is the best lesson of all, that a friend is a treasure to be cherished. After I graduated from the University of Texas, I went to Carnegie Institution of Washington, geophysical laboratory where I was a postdoc in Washington, D.C., and then I became a, a staff member there for 35 years. What I liked about my work was the freedom and creativity I had. I got to travel all over the world doing field work. I was in Svalbard, Australia, where I took my family several times, Belize, India, uh, the United States, and also I was able to build a substantial laboratory about six times. I met my husband, Chris Worth, in, in 1985. We got married a year later. Um, he's a Californian, I met him on a whale watching trip, and we started a family. I have two kids, Dana and Evan. After leaving Carnegie, I went to the University of California in Merced. I, it's a brand new university, and I was a professor teaching first generation students and uh, set up a major laboratory there. I met Marilyn for the first time at UC Merced. The first couple classes are kind of scorched into my memory where you go in, and, and, and Marilyn is there, you know, you meet someone new or you, your professor and you obviously you go Google them. And oftentimes you'll find a Rate My Professor page or something of that nature. But with, with Marilyn, I had to teach myself what an eye index was. This was someone who had lived, breathed, eaten intense science their entire career. Sure. Someone who cares so much about the people they work with. Someone who has such experience, such a willingness to work with people. I certainly would not be where I am without Marilyn's mentorship. It only serves to make me feel more fortunate for, for how truly special Marilyn is. Marilyn's mentorship to not only me, but dozens of other postdocs and graduate students, undergrads, and even, even high school students has really made a huge difference and a huge impact in their lives. And I think by far, and I think she would agree with this, her biggest legacy is, is, is are those people. She listens, she's caring, she's patient, and she's poised. And she not only pays attention to people's professional lives, but she pays attention to their personal lives. That doesn't mean she's prying, but she can, she can sense when there's something not right. There, you know, there's not enough I can say about what Marilyn's mentorship has meant to me. Marilyn works for the institution of UC Riverside, but, but she, in and of herself, is an institution. While I was working at UC Merced, it was getting increasingly more difficult to get anywhere or do anything, hold a cup of coffee. When I was walking, my foot would sort of slapped down on the ground. And people would say, walk faster, walk faster. I was falling over. When I was mowing the lawn, I fell over on the campus. I fell over on the house. And they said, go talk to your neurologist in Merced. There was like one neurologist. He only worked half time and he was... I said, this is ridiculous. So that was on a Thursday. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from UCSF saying, um, can you come Monday or Tuesday next week? And I said, Tuesday. I'll be there Tuesday. Um, finally, on May 24th, we went to San Francisco and got the diagnosis. Um, 
um, that I have ALS. Did my life change forever? Well, of course it did. And, and not in a, in a way that it changed forever in a way that I had never thought it would. You have your motor neurons, the neurons that are essentially activating your muscles, telling your muscles when to, when to twitch or when to contract. And that these neurons, these cells that traverse, that go from, the, from your brain all the way to your muscles, so there's these unusually long cells, they, they go through your spinal cord, they degenerate. And as they degenerate, there's no way to, for your brain to send the signals to your muscles to do the things that your muscles need to do. And so your, your muscles atrophy because I guess you could say the, the wires, our, our, our motor neurons that would normally activate them, they degenerate. And what's especially horrible about this, it obviously causes paralysis, people lose control over basic things including their speech is the whole time that this is happening and this is degenerating, the individual in, in question has, has full uh, mental awareness. So they're fully aware of what's going on in their body. So you could imagine it's a, it's a, it's a fairly uh, a horrible uh, thing for, for, for people to go through. Well, in the last four years, I've gone from being a completely independent person, getting on an airplane, flying around the world to becoming a completely dependent person. After the diagnosis, I wondered whether or not I would be what I thought would, was a lucky person who would live for five or eight years, maybe even 20 years, something like Stephen Hawking, or whether I would be one of the unlucky ones, the ones who couldn't talk or swallow fairly quickly and would pass away in, in a year or two. And it turns out I'm, I'm probably neither one. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I have a slow decline and, you know, I am where I am after three years. I stand up about 40 times a day, which I count them. Uh, uh, I don't know, it sounds like a lot to me. I think most people never count how many times they stand up and move around. But every time I do it, I have to pay a lot of attention to it that I don't tumble over or fall. So to go from the house out the door down to the car and into the car takes both of these uh, things traveling, walking and then me taking her uh, perhaps the rest of the way to the car in the wheelchair. Before she can get into the car she's got to get out of the wheelchair into the walker again and then back up very carefully and get into the car and then it takes a half a minute or more for her to swing her legs up, get them fully into the car, get herself adjusted. Life is like slow motion, where things that would normally have taken us 30 to 40 minutes, get up, cup of coffee, out the door, now take almost three times as long. Ah, going to the bathroom is one of the, the biggest challenges of my day. Um, Getting it stuck on a toilet seat is one of the most demeaning things uh, you can imagine. The, the worst thing was going and having a toilet that's supposed to be ADA compliant. I don't know what that means. It's a certain height, but I can no longer stand from a low position. So there you are in your most vulnerable position, sitting, sitting on a toilet and not being able to get off. Taking a shower, yeah. A shower is a slimy, slippery place where you have no clothes on and you look at yourself in a mirror and you see the ravages to your body that this disease has. I was never in a shape like this and it just is, um, it makes you cry when you see this. That's my lowest point of the week, is taking a shower.
well, it's ending my career. So um, this was my last uh, quarter of teaching. Um, teaching being somewhere at a set schedule at a certain time and having to project in my voice and be loud is it's it's getting to be too difficult. I, I don't think I could do it again. I don't want to be a burden on people when I get too bad. I there are glimmers when you just say like, Oh, I've had enough, let's just end this and then there are days when you would go like, Oh, how could I end this? Well, we live in the state of California and there's uh, patient-assisted suicide where you can take medication. Um, I think I'd be have a personally a hard time doing this. You know, when it came down to it, I think it would be very difficult for me to do this, and certainly it's not legal for anybody else. You know, my role is uh, I'm your husband, and I'm with her for life, and I'm her caregiver, so I've had to accept things that I really can't do anything about. The, the quick answer is that she's dealt with it amazingly well. Uh, the long answer is it's a struggle every day uh, and it's hard for me to imagine how she has to feel knowing every day that she has this disease that's never going to get better, it's only going to get gradually worse, and that it's shortening her life and her time on earth. So that's a tremendous mental burden that she has to deal with all the time. But if we look at her outwardly, she stays living as much of a normal life as she possibly can. And she has refused to let the disease define her uh, or to make her life miserable. I can't imagine that very many people would have been able to uh, be as positive and uh, work as hard to overcome the worst problems of ALS, both physically and mentally, uh, as she does. Well, medical advice is funny. Um, there is no uh, real cure for ALS. So I've chosen to have fun in life rather than saddle myself with medical uh, challenges that might not help. Jump off the ship! <laughs> it's cold! <laughs>
I think you, that's a hard question. I, I think you have to, what's important is um, friends and family. Uh, good food is important while I can eat. Uh, talking to people is important while I'm able to talk and communicate. And as those things uh, drop off, the ability to eat and talk and breathe, um, uh, it's it's the scary thing. It's not the dying that's scary, it's what is going to happen beforehand. And I'm going to look now directly into the camera. Um, what What is really important for me is for people to take the time to read and to educate themselves uh, about the challenges that somebody faces with ALS. I think sometimes people see me sitting in a chair and talking and think like, oh, she's fine. But in fact, uh, every small movement that I make throughout the day is a challenge. And when I know that family and friends have read about this, have thought about it, it makes a huge difference to me. Adventurous. Supportive. Astonishing. Redoubtable. R-E-D-O-U-B-T-A-B-L-E. Seems like something I should think about. Bold. Powerhouse. I was going to say badass, but I think I'll go with inspired and resourceful. Sort of she MacGyver's science and life. Honesty. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Funny, because Marilyn takes a story about not taking out your trash and not cleaning out your fridge and makes you smile and makes it somehow redeemable. Jersey! Incomparable! Courageous! Matronly. Holistic. Generosity. Passionate. Strong. Cool. Marilyn, Marilyn is, is perseverant. I think it's perseverant. Fun? That would be fun. For me, Marilyn has always served as my common sense touchstone. Um, her advice to me, her perspective on the world and on things, has always been grounded in common sense and love. Tessa, what word best describes Marilyn? Fun. Harumph. If it's one word, it's pretty much just gotta be a rumph. Can mean anything from you use what solvent to you know you really shouldn't have left the coffee on top of that gas chromatograph to um it's not about time you got married. But I think uh, underneath all that, the thing that harumph always really meant was uh, you know I'm watching out for you. Uh, I got your back. And uh, for things to come out all right, all you really need is just a little nudge. She's got it kind of on the spiritual side more. There's a kind of Zen consciousness about her now. Um, being around her, kind of a presence that she has. Daddy, what would describe Marilyn? Poise. Inspiring. Inspiring. Inspiration. Family. Marilyn, she's... She's resilient. She gets back up. Or when anyone else stumbles, she helps them back up. My relationship with Marilyn is unique. I know that some of her students refer to her as science mom, but for me, she is my work mom. Marilyn has taught me a lot about being a strong woman, and she's taught me that's, that fitting in is overrated. She definitely breaks the mold as to what a scientist looks like. For example, when she was selected into the National Academy of Sciences, she asked that the official announcement show the picture of her in a wheelchair. The reason she did this was to show that someone in a wheelchair can make important contributions. Um, I don't know, I don't know, she was there the day Elise was born. She looked, really? Uh, took off. Yeah, she looked Nobody after me when you were born. So I don't know, I don't know one word to kind of... Caring. Yeah, caring's good. Caring. How about any advice for... Caretakers. Yeah. 
it's especially hard for caretakers. Some days you're grumpy and you take it out on people and you don't feel good because you have to be angry at somebody. It doesn't make you feel very good. I am so lucky that I have so many people taking care of me that care. Uh, Chris does things, he doesn't see the ugliness that I see in my shape and my body. He doesn't see that at all, which is amazing. I mean, I think most people would be, you know, find it offensive and, you know, and so what advice would I give them is, um, you know, when you take care of somebody, it's the right thing to do. And when I die, those who have taken care of me will will rest easy that they did the right thing, even if it was hard. And they will have the comfort knowing that what they did was, was so important. I mean, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not cared for, you know, what is it, what does it matter? If I stay with you, if I'm choosing wrong, I don't care at all. If I'm losing now, but I'm winning late, that's all I want. I don't care at all. I am lost. I don't care at all. My time, my life is going on. Lost my time, my life is going.